So does shadow work help you ascend? It's a popular theory that integrating dark sides of our personality helps us spiritually evolve. And the theory is that if you evolve, you eventually graduate to higher densities when it's time to move into this golden age of humanity. And if you're not mature or evolved enough, you stay back, like not passing secondary school exams. So some are keen on making that transition, others not so much. So if you are keen, what are the best ways? Here are some suggestions that have worked for many people we've coached over the past 24 years that have given them inner peace, inner strength, and wisdom to handle what life throws at them. Hi, I'm Carly Rieger, and this is the Golden Age Timeline Podcast. So the definition of shadow work is to use a systematized way of exploring, processing, and integrating parts of your personality that are hidden. We all have programming or what we call disempowering mind stories from childhood. You know, where you made a decision based on a challenging circumstance. For example, in one man's case, he remembered he cried when his dog died as a child and his father disapproved of that kind of outward display of emotion. So he made an unconscious decision at the time to not cry outwardly. And that carried on through the rest of his life, making it hard for him to feel grief, process sad feelings, which led to lots of stuck emotions, which led to depression over time. Now, that wasn't the only reason he ended up there, but it was a big factor. Now, that's a strong example, but there are big and small ways we've disempowered ourselves throughout our lives, causing this shadow self to build up. Now, how you deprogram yourself depends on each person. You have to find something that works for you, but it is part of the spiritual evolution of any individual seeking to learn from the lessons of their life and potentially ascending to this higher level of frequency. And every culture, every family has acceptable things and unacceptable things. You are encouraged directly and indirectly to display the acceptable things and discourage directly and indirectly to not display unacceptable things. What might be true in one culture and one family could be very different in another. In my family, which was British Austrian, no one was allowed to raise their voice. Now we did at times, but it was highly frowned upon. Meanwhile, our Italian neighbors were always raising their voice. If you didn't express your feelings about things in the family, then that was highly frowned upon. So think about that in your growing up environment. What was acceptable or not acceptable? The not acceptables are one place to look for the shadow. So whatever was unacceptable causes a duality in a person. The acceptable things are in the conscious personality and the unacceptable things are in the unconscious personality. And the fact that you have to separate like that is probably the first act of rejection of yourself. So you have aspects of your personality you're aware of and some you are not aware of. Literally working on your shadow means working on things you cannot see. That's why it's tricky. Other people who know you well can often see it much better than you. But if you've ever met someone who seems congruent, comfortable with themselves, a real inner peace about them, something you sense, not necessarily something they say, chances are they've done shadow work. They aren't unconsciously fighting to repress a part of themselves. They've seen it, learned from it, accepted it, forgiven themselves and let it go. Because of that, they don't need to attract negative things or people to make them pay attention and do the shadow work. Because life will bring you these things if you don't choose to do it consciously. A famous quote by the 20th century psychoanalyst Carl Jung is, whatever you repress and hide will only manifest itself later as destiny. 
For example, I had a client who was told as a girl by her mother to keep quiet and not express her opinion if she wanted to attract a man. I know that might seem funny to some these days, but it was and is actually quite common. That caused her to repress her true opinions, not just with a potential romantic partner, but with all men. She grew up to be a repressed adult in that aspect, insecure and with little self-value about her own point of view in the world. But the moment she discovered the root of this issue, the fact that her mother indirectly condemned her as a child, if she spoke up, she can now choose to keep that mind story or change it to a better one. She can essentially grow herself up, come into the present moment and see the world from the adult perspective where expressing her opinion is safe, can be safe, and can still mean she's attractive to a man if that's what she wants. And since she was learning to do public speaking and there were lots of men in the audience, This meant she could start feeling confident and comfortable on stages as well. Now, of course, we are full of programs or mind stories that are empowering, disempowering, neutral. The trick here is not to try to get rid of all of it because then you'd have no personality, no preferences, no infrastructure with which to interact with the world. It's just most people haven't chosen which programs, which mind stories they want. They haven't been the writer of their own story. So it's just about taking back control of something that is your inherent right to control. There's a lot of highly sophisticated means in our society of entrenching people in disempowering mind stories. So if we want to evolve ourselves and help others, it helps to see through that and take back our power. Luckily, we are at a time in history when that kind of information is becoming more and more readily available, and there's more highly skilled people to help you with that, and many highly skilled processes. Now, if you've read my novel Heliotropus, you know that shadow work is a big theme, along with the idea of spiritual ascension and growth. So if you haven't read it, and if you learn best through a page-turning adventure fantasy, you can read that and understand at least a few powerful ways of integrating the shadow. Shadow work is also something I have done with many clients over the years, especially using the Avara model in our book, Mind Story Inner Coach. And you can get both those books at goldenagetimeline.com backslash shop. So everything you interpret is the result of a program a mind story. For example, liking chocolate is a program. Disliking Brussels sprouts is a program. Running late often is a program. Being punctual is a program. And you can be your own programmer and hack your system and load up on the programs you want. And if you want to get really esoteric and high level about it, being able to see and feel a chair that you're sitting on is also a program. So programs aren't good or bad. They're just the infrastructure through which we interact with the world. They're the elements in the game that you're playing. But who dictates what is acceptable and what is not? Is it the society or the individual? It's both. Your society or culture has a shadow side and a light side, as well as you as a person. Your family has a shadow side and a light side. An organization you belong to has a shadow and a light side. We live in a world of duality. So if you ever meet somebody who seems totally good and perfect, chances are they've got some bad and imperfect aspects as well. Perhaps part of the game of this life we live is to accept both. And when you accept both, you start an alchemical process of ascension where you merge and grow into something new, a third entity that is unified. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons to do shadow work is it leads to unification and unification leads to ascension into higher realms of existence. Of course, as I said, not everyone is on the ascension path. And if they're not, that's okay. There's a theory that source energy that we all come from separates itself into 
microcosmic parts to experience duality. And you are one of those microcosmic parts. It does that because it's different than unity. So if you are a young soul just heading out into that exploration, you'll want to go towards duality, conflict, shadow versus light, evil versus good, up versus down, day versus night, because that's the adventure. But if you've been on the adventure for a while, you might want to start to return to the source, to the unity, to the wholeness. You've had enough of the roller coaster and you want to get off. Usually that's the older souls. They're thinking, I had my adventure ready to mellow out now. Again, one is not better than the other. It's just a different phase of the journey. That said, living a life where you are unconscious of your shadow and just acting out, reacting, not understanding why you attract things you don't like, not understanding why you feel the way you do can be very stressful. If you're ready to have more inner peace, inner resilience and inner wisdom, this is important work to do. Now there's another great quote by Florence Scovel Shin. If you do not run your subconscious mind yourself, someone else will run it for you. So many media and social media channels these days are filling our minds with dire news. And while it does help to stay informed so that you can take appropriate action, be aware that these news items do activate the survival brain trigger cycle in a lot of people activating the shadow and cutting you off from your higher thinking capacities. And many of our clients have noticed that when they do the shadow work, they just don't get triggered by these media items or by other people nearly as much. They stay in this neutral, calm place far more often. So instead of saying things they later regret or catastrophizing that something really bad is going to happen, they get into this neutral calm state more quickly, which allows them to access their problem solving abilities, which also helps them stay healthy physically and mentally. Now, as I mentioned in my company, Mind Story Coaching Academy, we refer to mindsets using the broader definition of mind stories to include the entire operating system behind a mindset an attitude, a perspective, a way of being. Because our research shows that humans live in stories like a fish lives in water. We don't even realize it. For example, on average, people spend 60% of their waking lives telling stories. Maybe you can relate. You're talking to your spouse about something that happened that day. You're sitting around the dinner table talking about something that happened to someone you know. And you're also telling stories to yourself throughout the day and giving meaning to the experiences you have. That's just how the brain operates. So once you realize that, you can make it work in your favor. So if you can relate to that, ask yourself this question. Are you telling stories to yourself and others that are empowering and supportive, or are they disempowering and unsupportive? Most people are telling disempowering stories, and the motivation to do it is happening subconsciously below their awareness. So making conscious choices around this habit can entirely change your life for the better and change the life of those you influence, especially in this current world situation. So I'll use a theater metaphor because I think a lot of people can relate to that. You've probably acted in a play or a show at some point in your life as a kid or maybe older. So, you know, you put on a costume and you have a script to learn. Now, in my 20s, I studied acting, playwriting, and directing. And as an actor, I remember that process of putting on my costume and rehearsing some of my opening lines to help me morph into the character. And if you've ever acted in a play, maybe you'll relate to that phenomenon too. Now, if the play went on for a while, like a few weeks, I noticed that the character started to spill over into my regular life. So I once played this character who was stuck in hell during the entire play. And it was called No Exit. And I noticed that I had a hellish experience in my regular life during this time, feeling stuck in these mindsets and frustrated and in conflict with many people around me. But then when the play ended, that feeling disappeared. The truth is, all of us regularly take on characters and follow scripts in our lives. 
you know, as a spouse or a parent or a child, friend, employee, leader. And as the old Shakespeare quote says, all the world is a stage and all the men and women are merely players. And as I said, the brain organizes itself in story form. And there are many components of a mind story, such as archetypal characters, core scripts, and core beliefs. Now, an archetype, in case you're not familiar, is a term coined by Carl Jung. Or another metaphor is, it's like a software program that you load onto a device. It's full of instruction sets for implementing specific objectives. And the truth is, you can load or delete these programs if you know how. The problem comes if you don't learn this ability to upgrade your mind stories, or you only remove a part of a mind story when really you needed to remove the whole thing. For example, this can often happen with, say, an affirmation. You say to yourself, I believe in my ability to succeed, but you have a whole mind story keeping you entrenched in a character whose main objective in life is not to succeed. There are subconscious payoffs for that archetypal inner character to not succeed. There are scripts and plots and intentions all interweaved together in neural networks that need to be disentangled before that new, more empowering mind story becomes a reality. Another way of thinking about a process like affirmations is like removing only one line of code in a malware program. It's still there. It's still going to make you underperform. Now, some people believe that life is a simulated reality, and some scientific papers are seeking to prove it. So let's say that's true, that life is just a game where we're here learning certain life lessons in some kind of virtual reality playground. And if that's true, say we're all given amnesia when we arrive in the game, just to give us a kind of game handicap so that we would stay focused and learn. Like if you knew the whole thing is just a game and how it ends, you might not be so motivated to learn. So if that's true, then perhaps we can go into the proverbial costume room of the simulated reality and choose a character to play around with. You may have seen Star Trek episodes where they go into these virtual reality playgrounds and then they want to change something. They go in and they delete a character and add a character. So you can do that with yourself. There's literally thousands of characters you could choose. Some people choose the beggar, others the orphan or the victim or maybe the hero or the guide or the scholar. Now, unconsciously, when I was younger, I latched onto the orphan, the victim and the lost girl. My parents split up when I was young and they were both very busy with work and didn't have a lot of time for kids. So I basically raised myself. And I remember at 12 years old, if I wanted clothes, I had to make the money doing like a paper route to pay for them because that's the only job I could get at 12. And if I had to go to like the dentist, I had to take a 45 minute bus trip there by myself and other kids didn't have to do that. Their parents drove them there and bought them the clothes. And why didn't I get that? Now, when I was older, I saw that circumstance as a gift. I decided to reframe it as a gift because because I became much more independent at a much younger age than many of my friends. At the time, however, I thought it meant there was something wrong with me, that my parents wouldn't do all that stuff for me. I was shuffled between neighbors' homes, and past a certain age, I was simply left to my own devices. I had no curfew. I could do whatever I liked, which some of my friends were jealous of, but to me, I just felt like an orphan and the lost girl and the victim. Another person in the same circumstances probably would have chosen different archetypal characters to take on, more empowering ones. And I chose those negative ones mainly due to the meaning I gave that situation. And any archetype like that of the orphan comes loaded with scripts and tends to spawn other disempowering scripts. Scripts are like your core motivation. And in the theater world, directors are always asking their actors to focus on their character's core motivation in each scene. Otherwise, the scene will lose its impact. So the orphan's core script is usually, I'm not good enough. And its core motivation is, I have to prove I'm good enough which is an exhausting way to live. And that 
orphan script kind of spawned the lost girl archetype. And her script was, I'm confused about where to go and what to do. And her core motivation became trying to find the right path. Now, feeling like a lost girl orphan made me a good target for bullies, and that spawned the victim archetype, whose script was, why do bad things keep happening to me, and a core motivation of trying to run away from being victimized. But in a way, if you're always trying to run away from that, you tend to attract it. So one archetype tends to lead to the others and becomes what we call a mind virus, Now, living out these negative archetypes can go on for years for people, as it did for me, until I learned how to change them. So while I was studying playwriting and acting, I had this transformational idea. It occurred to me that I could change these inner story components. And I realized that my most commonly used characters, those three that I named, became kind of like my inner committee members. You know, like I think we all have members of the board of your inner organization and they make decisions on your behalf for good or for bad. And most of this, again, is happening below your conscious awareness. But once you become aware of them, you can literally fire certain inner committee members and hire better ones, which is what I did. So this is how I did it. I've talked about the hero's journey in other episodes, which is a whole structure of storytelling that myth expert Joseph Campbell identified. He researched stories in all cultures throughout history, and notice that humans tell the same basic story. So if you listen to any compelling story that gets told over and over again, and gets passed down through the generations, it tends to have the same basic story structure. It's where the hero gets a call to action, which he refuses, but then for some reason he has to go on the adventure and he gets pulled out of his comfort zone and there's mentors and teachers that help the hero and the hero faces enemies and challenges and temptations and at some point the hero always gets stuck in the belly of the whale i also like to call this the winter of change the dark night of the soul and then they engage in a final conflict and if the hero gets through that he or she returns home a wiser better and more resilient person ready to help others If we activate our inner heroic nature, then it forces us to dig down deep and cultivate the bravery and wisdom that we need to grow. So any winter of change or dark night of the soul experience is, as you may be aware, usually a hidden gift, especially if we're looking at life as a game, to activate us to be better people if we choose to learn and go on the journey. If we resist it, then we don't get to learn and then we get stuck there. Now, if you get stuck in the belly of the whale, stuck in that winter of change, in the conflicts or the temptations to distract yourself away from the pain of growth, then you don't get to continue on the hero's journey. You don't get to bring back the wisdom to others. So remember, I was telling you about being in this play called No Exit, about being in hell. So I asked the director of the play if he wanted to end the run of this play and put on another play because I didn't want to keep playing this person stuck in hell. And we talked about it with the rest of the cast, and they all agreed that, heck, let's put on a more fun, a lighter play. And so he mounted a comedy pantomime, kind of a farce. And I got to play the fairy godmother, full with wings getting flown around the stage on wires and everything. (laughs) And it had this spillover into the rest of my life where I started looking for ways that I could make other people's lives better. I felt lighter and happier because we would be in these rehearsals all the time laughing. We, the audience would laugh and it completely changed my <laughs> brain capacity. And that made me realize maybe I could ask my inner director to give me a new role. So the inner director is like, you know, your higher self, maybe you could call it the game maker, you know, rather than being the user of the game, you're the game creator, right? You're all, you're both, you're the game user and the game creator, if you remember and utilize that skill to change the rules of the game. So that's what I did. I just tried saying to this inner director, I'd like a better role. What do you got? And that's what I got. So here's one way to do that in your own life. 
Think of a disempowering archetypal character you live by and be honest with yourself. No one likes to admit that they act like a victim or feel that way, but many people do. It's very highly programmed into the human collective consciousness and know that this is very common. And few people would like to see themselves as a beggar, but again, people are feeling economically challenged and going into a scarcity mindset around money and what's gonna happen with the economy. And it would be normal actually to start feeling like a beggar, having to ask the government for money or to go to your bank and get you know, some kind of debt relief or something. So because these are shadow archetypes, in the unconscious, for the most part, it sometimes helps to ask someone close to you who sees you from the outside, what is an archetype, a negative archetype you see me living from? And just be willing to hear the answer and don't get offended. Because <laughs> you can't change it until you know what it is, right? So once you know what it is, like in my case, the orphan, just find the opposite. So to me, that meant the connector, the person who has a family or who creates a family, who has friends who care, a community who cares and a support around her and who creates it and attracts it. And then instead of the lost girl, I wanted to be a guide who had clarity of direction and helped others do the same. Instead of the victim, I wanted to be self-responsible and the hero of my own life. So these archetypes and scripts created new, more supportive mind stories, which acted like antibodies healing me from the mind virus of disempowerment. Then you want to look at scripts. These empowering archetypal characters had embedded scripts and motivations, just like the negative ones. For example, the connector script was, I'm good enough to be supported. And again, you might not believe it at first, but if you come at it from this whole archetypal character, it's easier to take on. It's easier to start writing the neural pathways than if you're trying to force one affirmation onto a pre-existing negative archetype, if that makes sense. And the guide might have a core script of, I know the way and I'm here to help others find it too. And the hero says, I rescue myself and looks for ways to take full responsibility for what life brings, see the gift and choose to learn. Now, many people think, uh, I think I have to wait till something outside of me happens to change a self-image or an archetypal way of being in the world. And it seems like that sometimes, but almost always the impetus comes from within. It's a deep decision within that you can make in an instant. It's very hard to change the external world without changing the way you view the world first. The external follows the internal and not the other way around. Most people don't realize it or forget it. It's the exploration, deconstruction, and reconstruction of the mind story that causes changes outside to happen. And that's easy to forget, even for people who have done years of personal growth work. But the good news is that you've already changed mind stories many times throughout your life. How do I know that? Well, think of an external event in your life when your self-image seemed to go up or down dramatically. For example, I spoke at a huge international conference when I was 30 and I got a standing ovation. After that, I began to think of myself as a good speaker. But before that, I thought of myself as just an average speaker. So was it the external event or an internal choice? I did receive a standing ovation once before, a year before that event, but I had interpreted that situation differently. After the first one, I said to myself, oh, I just got that standing ovation because the audience likes to do that for speakers. It's not about me or my abilities as a speaker. The second time was also in front of an audience that often gave standing ovations, but I chose to see myself as a good speaker after that. And of course, my skills improved because of that self-image. It's always the meaning you give to those external events and the decisions you make that drives your results. So our research at MindStory Academy shows that the greatest minds and hearts on the planet have a different set of mind stories than the average person. Because your results in any endeavor will always match your subconscious mind story, always. There's no exception. 
So if life is a game, you have control of the joystick. You can develop a mind story that supports your vision or one that shackles you to failure. It's all up to you. And that's good news and bad news. It means you can't be in the blaming victim role any longer. And some people, they really don't want to accept that. It's just so much easier to blame the government, politicians, external situations, people in your family for what's making you feel bad. But it's always the choice of the thoughts you choose to have about that situation. And that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people to face. But it's your ticket to freedom. So to uncover disempowering mind stories, you need to be totally honest with yourself. And you may think you're free of limiting mind stories when you aren't. This is another way people get stuck. I had a client who came to me for help to get ready for a high profile speaking engagement. She taught interpersonal communication and had studied tons of personal growth topics for years. But I could see that she felt terrified leading up to the event because of her tone of voice, her shaking hand when she rehearsed, her furrowed brow, but she insisted she felt fine. Finally, the day before the event, she had this complete emotional breakdown, which led her to open up first to herself and then to me and reach out to me for help. So I helped her see the old scripts and archetypes from her childhood that still influenced her. So even though to the outside world, she seemed super successful, on the inside, she felt like a total imposter. She didn't feel worthy of all the money and the status that she got with her career. And it all got magnified during a high profile speaking engagement like that. But the good news was that by accepting those hidden fears, she could explore the interpretations driving those feelings and then change them. So by using her neocortex to view the survival brain trigger cycle at play, she could start to change the way the neural pathways fired, training her brain to stay in a high performance state in a high stakes situation. So the speaking engagement ended up being a huge success. She got a standing ovation and five invitations to speak again. But it was a good reminder to me and to her that no matter how much inner work a person thinks they've done, myself included, the old mind stories may still surface. So having tools like the ones we teach at Mind Story Academy or ones you successfully used in the past are important to keep close at hand. So here's a few other practical tools to help you break free of any limiting mind stories. So an important step in forming your new, more empowering mind story is to realize what your beliefs are and to question those that no longer serve. Otherwise, beliefs left unchallenged will continue to limit you. To that end, answer the following questions to the best of your ability. What is a goal or vision you'd like to achieve? So it could be financial, life success, health, relationships, or career goal. And just pick one specific one for the sake of this mental activity. For example, bring in three new coaching clients over the next month, or produce a new Zoom webinar, or set up a home gym. Got one? Okay, next ask yourself, what is one disempowering story in the way to achieving this? Now, most of us talk ourselves out of our successes before the day even begins. We tend to focus on the negative first thing in the morning. So think about if that's true for you. Think back to this morning. What happened when you first woke up? Did you worry Doubt, regret, most people do. If so, how did that voice sound? So start to examine this voice from a neutral place like you were a curious scientist rather than getting pulled into the drama of the voice. Now these voices are unique to each individual, but here are some of the ones that we frequently hear from clients when they start thinking about achieving a goal. See if you identify with any of them. Uh, It's hard to make money, especially these days. I don't know where to begin. It just seems too hard. I'll do it later when I have a few free moments, which never happens. I can't make money doing what I love. I'm not good enough yet. I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough. Hey, I've got children you don't understand. Hey, I got a lot of problems you don't understand. I'm too young. I'm too old. 
I don't have enough time. I'm unworthy of success. I just don't get the lucky breaks in life that others get. I'm destined for a life of struggle. This situation is just going to get worse. People won't think what I offer is of any value to them. I'm not experienced enough. I'm not organized enough. I'm just not enough. Okay, now just pick one. You might have many. Assuming you were to hold on to that particular limiting story for the next, say, five years, what would it do to your future? How would it affect the quality of your life, your relationships, your finances? Okay, that's just to give yourself a reality check. For example, the minute you start hearing the old familiar voice of negativity, your favorite limiting phrase, you could have a memorized phrase such as, I'm so happy and grateful for the support I'm going to get today. Even if you don't believe it, you're just playing a game with your mind, right? Just think of it as training your dog to do a new trick, right? Or another day where I'm going to be moving closer towards my big vision. Right? You're giving yourself a pep talk, like a coach talking to a football team. What an amazing opportunity to step up and contribute to helping others and making the world a better place. Now, you can also simply do a turnaround on them. You may not believe them at first again, but after a while, you actually do hypnotize yourself into believing them or starting to believe them, which then spawn these new archetypes through the repetition. I remember it's just a game, so have fun with it. For example, it's easy to make money, especially these days, because of what I have to offer. I can easily figure out where to begin. It totally seems doable. I'll do it first thing. I can make money doing what I love. I'm good enough. I totally have what it takes. I'm smart enough. Even though I've got children, I can still make this work. Even though I've got problems, I can still get this happening. I'm the perfect age. I have enough time. I'm totally worthy of success. I often get lucky breaks in my life. I'm destined for a life of success. This situation is going to get better. People will think what I offer is of great value to them. I've totally got enough experience now. I'm organized enough now. I'm enough now. And one of the most powerful questions to ask yourself is, what difficult things have I accomplished before? I remember back to when I wrote my first novel. I remember getting my first batch of books from the printers and this overwhelming feeling of accomplishment that I had at the time. And as soon as I tapped into that empowering mind story, it's like loading the software in my own biocomputer to keep moving forward with my present day book writing goal. By acknowledging your own successes, it helps you build belief in your ability to achieve important goals and belief is the engine of manifestation. Let me say that again. Belief is the engine of manifestation. Believe without doubt and it comes about. So your answers to these questions, just start building your new mind story at the neural network level of your brain. So imagine those new neural networks of empowering mind stories forming and building strength. Feel the strength. I remember, do one of these the next time you catch yourself looping, like first thing in the morning, tomorrow morning, give it a try. The more you do it, the better you get, the stronger you get. So if you enjoyed listening to this episode and want more tools like this, do check out our free online masterclass entitled Re-Inspired. Discover the five-step tri-unity process to get clarity on what's next in your life by overcoming negative inner stories so you can achieve life-changing results.
in 2022. Just go to the events tab at goldenagetimeline.com to sign up. And you can check out, as I said, the Mind Story Inner Coach book. If you like nonfiction books with fill in the blanks processes like the Avara model to guide you through finding and releasing regrets, resentments, past blocks, shadow material, and freeing yourself up for creating a life you love. Also, do check out the page turning fantasy adventure novel Heliotropus. It is the winner of four book awards. All books and online courses are at goldenagetimeline.com backslash shop, or just go to the shop tab. We take crypto as well as cards and PayPal. So that's it for now. Do like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Until next time, have a great week.